Um, in the bulletins, it says I'm going to be in Revelation, but I decided not to do that message this week. I'll do that next week. I'm going to do a New Year's message. And um, interesting, we sang some of the themes, some of the things that we're going to talk about today. When we sang, Are You Washed in the Blood? So my message as we close out 2023 and look forward to 2024 is this, rest. Doesn't that sound nice? Sometimes I'll look at Pam and, and like, it'd be nice to do, what is that thing called? It starts with an R, uh, you know, uh, uh, rest, <laughs> run. Yeah, that's what we're always doing, running, but rest. Um, and I'm not talking here about physical rest. I'm talking about spiritual rest. And uh, we did sing about that. Are, are you uh, resting, uh, was it, do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So that's kind of the idea that I want to talk about. Um, one of the things I want to remind everybody about, though, as we get into the message, is we uh, rest in Christ. That is, we rest in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the nature of faith not trying to earn your salvation or do anything on your own uh, to save yourself, but to fully trust, rest in, again, the person and work of Jesus Christ. But as a result of resting in the person and work of Jesus Christ, there are things that we do. So we want to be careful, though, not to get those two things confused. So this is that idea that I've mentioned in the past. In the Greek, uh, especially in Paul's writings, and Peter does this too, and other writers, God gives us the indicatives, that is, the things that he has done for us in Christ so that we can rest in him. And then after the indicatives come the imperatives, the commands. So we do not to be saved, we do because we are saved. So that's, that's the key here, and, and we'll be talking about that as we move on. So a couple of passages that I wanted to open up with and we'll look at as we get started, one of them is in Matthew. So if you have your Bibles or devices, turn to Matthew chapter 11, and we'll look at a passage that we are all uh, familiar with. So Matthew chapter 11, verse, starting at verse 27. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Um, he says that only he knows the Father, and only those that he decides to reveal the Father to can know the Father. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about salvation. Um, if you think about in John uh, chapter 17, verse 3, we won't turn there. Jesus says, he defines what eternal life is. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. What's eternal life? To know God, to have God the Father revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And then Jesus gives this call, and I would say it's the effectual call to those who he has elected. It is, come to me. So this isn't uh, uh, Jesus pleading with us. This is a, a command. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how does the Son reveal the Father to us that we might be saved? He gives us this call, come to me and I will give you rest. And who does he say come to come? All who are weary and heavy laden. Well, what wearies us? What makes us heavy laden? Well, it's that point at which we come to recognize our guilt before God. And then if we're heavy burdened, it might be because we're trying to earn our own salvation, trying to do that which God commands us to be saved when that's not the way we are saved. And so when you do that, you become very weary and tired and worn out. And you can think about all the people that were trying to keep the law during Jesus' time who were trying to earn their salvation. Or you can think about people like that today. There are um, sects of what would be included in Christendom, I wouldn't say they are, but that say you have to earn your salvation. 
Um, I remember at Martha's funeral, the, the pastor who did the church was from a oneness Pentecostal church, and he was always sowing doubt about whether anyone was ever saved because they were counting on their own works righteousness to be saved. And it's like, you're wearied, you're heavy laden. But Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. That rest is that abiding, that trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ, trusting his law keeping, trusting his payment on the cross for our sins to, to save us, not to try to save ourselves. And Jesus says, goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, for you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's his yoke and his burden? Well, resting and trusting in him. And then as a result of that, obeying him. But again, we're not obeying him to be saved. We're obeying him because we are saved if we have trusted in him by resting in what he has done for us. And that's, that's justifying faith. So justifying faith requires rest, just simply resting in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we have to be careful because there are a lot of teaching out there uh, that would say that uh, you have to totally surrender to Christ in order to be saved. Anyone out there ever totally surrender? Is every area of your life surrendered? I'm just, you're the most saintly among us, so I'm just asking. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not argue. <laughs> and so we can, even from good teachers, we can swerve into that, that, uh, works righteousness where we think that we have to, to work to keep our salvation and, and then that, that sows doubts and, and that makes us weary and, and heavy laden because we're always questioning, did I do enough? Did I believe hard enough to, to be saved? And I had mentioned this, that it, it galled me at the time at my mom's funeral. The, the pastor who did the, the funeral did a great gospel presentation, but then it was, if you, how did he put it? If you, if you really, truly believe, like, you know, so that so is doubt. Did I did I believe enough? Did I did I have enough faith? And I know my mom did worry about that, and I had to talk with her before she died about that. <sighs> That's just one of the reasons why I decided to do the gospel presentation at my brother-in-law's funeral. But his testimony was great because when my sister asked him if he knew he was going to heaven, he or where he was going, he pointed up. And then she said, you know that you can't save yourself, right? It's just Jesus. And he said, yes, that's the rest that we're talking about. I'm just trusting in what Christ did and who he is in order to save me. Um, so another passage that I want to spend some time in that, that also talks about this rest is in Hebrews. So we've been in Hebrews recently. So if you turn to Hebrews chapter 4, And we'll start at verse 1. Get there. Writer of Hebrews is writing again to a group of believers who are in danger of abandoning Christ, abandoning that rest to go back to works righteousness, to go back to keeping the law. And so he's got to write to them and tell them that they can't do that. And he uses as an example... Um, those who were disobedient, those in the Old Testament during the Exodus, as he puts it, that heard good news preached to them but did not mix it with faith. And so God was displeased with them and destroyed them. And so the, their bodies were scattered all over the desert. They died during that time because of unbelief. And the writer of Hebrews goes on to talk about the rest that, the, that God provides. So in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, let us fear... If, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to co have come short of it. So, wonderful to, to think about, there is a promise of entering into God's rest. So, this is a part of God's promise in the gospel that if we trust in Jesus Christ, if we hear the gospel and believe it, then we have this promise that we enter his rest. Okay? And then he says... Um, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest uh, in case any one of you may have come, seem to have come short of it. And he had to warn him this severely because, again, they, there were already people among them that had left the, the gospel and gone back to the law. And so 
He's just warning them, make sure that you haven't done that in your heart. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the, the, the gospel and that rest. So verse 2, for indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So again, we're talking about the generation in the Exodus that disobeyed God and died before they were able to get into the promised land, those that wandered in the desert for 40 years. And they had good news preached to them. What's the good news? The gospel. So they had good news preached to them, but they did not believe. So what they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. And then he goes on, wonderful statement, for we who have believed enter that rest, just as he had said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So very stark here. Those who have believed enter God's rest, they're resting in Christ, they rest from their works. But on the other hand, just as much as it is promised to us that we have believed, if we believe we enter that rest, it's also a promise that if you don't believe, you will not enter God's rest. So you can see that justifying faith is this rest, this resting in Christ. And he goes, goes on to say, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So God has rested from his works from the foundation of the world, but those who be don't believe can't enter into that rest. But that rest is ongoing for those who do believe. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying, Through David, after so long a time, just as been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So just to unpack that, that statement, he mentions that Joshua had not given them rest. For if he had, God would not have had to say later in the Psalms, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So when the people of the Exodus entered the promised land, that was not the rest that God was forward, looking forward to. That was a form of rest. It was a type of the rest for those who believe, but it's a type and a shadow of crossing Jordan in the sense of going into the age to come. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, verse 9. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. So what these, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying is that God has finished his work, and those who enter into God's rest also rest from their works. So again, we don't have to keep the law in order to be saved. We obey God because we have been saved, because if we believe, we have already entered into that rest. So with that in mind, um, that rest that we get when we're justified and we enter into God's rest brings rest in many different ways. One, we rest from our own works. We're trusting in Christ and his righteousness, his law keeping. We're trusting his death on the cross was sufficient to pay for our sins. It satisfied God's wrath against us. And it also brings rest in the sense that we're no longer at war with God. When we're justified by faith, we have peace with God. So you don't have to turn over there, but in Romans chapter 5, that's exactly what Paul says. Verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, entering into that rest, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace with him. Now, we talk about peace a lot in our culture today, right? And everybody's looking for peace, especially they're looking for an, a tranquility or an inner peace where they can not have those <laughs> voices talking to them and always be in fear and anxiety. Uh, how good is the world at that? So people, they're chasing all the latest things today. How much peace is that bringing them? <laughs> Not much, none at all, right? In fact, it's making their lives worse. It's taking away peace and bringing more anxiety in them. Um, so we're, we're not necessarily talking about that inner tranquility, although it does come when you rest in Christ, 
where we're talking about no longer being God's enemy. Okay? So we're no longer God's enemy. We are his children. We are part of his family when we come to know Jesus Christ, when they're resting in his person and finished work. Um, so with that in mind, though, there is a war that we do enter when we enter into the rest of Christ. So what's that war that we all, become, that we all uh, have to partake of after we rest in Christ while we're in this physical body, while we're in this present evil age? It's the war with the flesh, the world, and the devil. Okay? What I want to focus on now, though, is that, that battle that we have with the flesh. Okay? <clears throat> So to do that, turn to Colossians. And Colossians chapter 3. And again, I will remind you, pay attention to the, that, uh, that, that contrast between the, the indicatives, the things that God has done for us in Christ, and the imperatives, the commands. Okay? In verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Okay, so, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, is he questioning that if you have entered into the rest of, uh, of faith, that you may or may not have been raised with Christ? Is that what he's doing here, Paul? No, he's stating a fact. And, and he's just putting it in the sense, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, then what should you do as a result of that? Okay, so recall, we, we talked about this when we studied Ephesians. When we put our faith in Christ, when we rest in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ, spiritually, a number of things happen to us. Okay, we're justified, we're sanctified, set apart for God's use. Okay, we're not made instantly perfect, but set apart for God's use. We're glorified. Um, lots of things, and we're also, Paul tells us in Ephesians and in Colossians, raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places, spiritually, okay? So if you have trusted in Christ, you've passed from death to life, and you are now alive in Christ. So Paul is saying, if you have been raised with Christ, and you have, so that's the indicative of what God has done, what should you do in response, okay? Because we're heavenly creatures, we're with Christ in a spiritual sense in the heavenly places as we sit here or stand here in our physical bodies, right? So what are we to do as a result of that? Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, okay? So again, what has God done for us? When he saved us, he's raised us up with Christ and seated us with the in the heavenly places, all right? That's our spiritual reality, but physically, where are we at? On earth, in our bodies, that still struggle with sin. And we're in this present evil age. So we've got the world and the devil also fighting us. But as a result of being raised with Christ, here's what we're to do. Here's the imperative. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Okay. So what's Paul saying? That we should just be really heavenly minded and always just go around with halos in our hands like this and only think about heavenly things and ignore the things of this earth? Is that what we're supposed to do? Okay, thank you. No, <laughs> right? We, we are citizens of this kingdom. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. We, we have our feet in both worlds. We are to live certain ways as we're on this earth. But how do we do that? We live properly in our physical bodies by setting our minds on the things above. And what are the things above? Lots of things. The fact that we are justified, the fact that we are forgiven, the fact that we have been sanctified, the fact that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We have to think about those things and the hope of, that has promised us that we will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. These bodies will give, give way to um, spiritual bodies at some point. So set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Okay, so that's one. That's, that's how we are to um, begin to f fight this battle. Um, let me put it this way. This might be helpful too. 
what we're really going to see is Paul is telling us to, one, kill the flesh, okay? Or as he puts it in other places, put off the old man, like you're putting off garments. And then at the same time as we're, another way to say that is put to death the deeds of the flesh. At the same time that we do that, we are to also do those things in concert with the work of the Holy Spirit to bring health and vitality to the new man, that spiritual man. Okay? And I love the way the, the older pastors and theologians put this. So this would be like the Reformers and the Puritans. They, said, they called it this. You, you, on one hand, mortify the flesh. Okay? What does it mean to mortify? Kill. Okay? More, that comes from the uh, word that means death. Um, when, when, you, when you die and your body goes to a funeral home, who prepares your body? A mortician, okay? So you mortify the flesh, you kill it, and on the other hand, you vivify the new man. What does it mean to vivify? Bring life to. Same word we get vitality from, okay? Um, so, and then arbor vitae, the tree of life. Vitae means life. So those are two things that we have to constantly be doing, and we're doing that for ourselves and for those around us. We'll see that as we continue in, in Colossians, okay? So, we have been raised with Christ. As a result of that, that's what God's done for us, our job is to obey the command to set our minds on the things above and not on the things that are on the earth. Okay? And it doesn't mean that we don't give attention to our jobs and our families and those things. No, we're supposed to. It's just that we're not to be caught up in the things of the world, just, just you know, surrounding ourselves with worldly pleasures and worldly things. We're to set our minds on the things above. Why? Well, here's another um, indicative. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, this seems, seems contradictory. We've been told we've been raised with Christ. We're alive with him. But on the other hand, we're told we have died. What's died? Our old self. Okay? Although that old self still clings on as a dead man, um, and we still struggle with, with the flesh and sin. But we have died with Christ, at the same time, we have been raised with Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. So our life is hidden in, in, with Christ. Where is Christ right now? Seated at the right hand of God the Father. So our old self has died in Christ. That's what we, we symbolize in baptism. You, you've uh, been buried with Christ and then raised to newness of life. So we have been raised to life. Okay. So when Christ, verse 4, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Okay? So here we've got another indicative. This is what God's done. But this is, I love to use this word, eschatological. It's, it's talking about future things. Okay? So this is our hope. This is what we can trust in and bank on that when Christ is revealed, Okay, and when is Christ going to be revealed? When he comes back, okay, the second time. And when he comes back, he is going to be revealed, and then when he's revealed, guess who also is going to be revealed? What we are, who we are in Christ. So this is what God has done for us or going to do for us, but in God's economy, it's a done deal. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Just, here, here's something to set your minds on, on the things above. Just think about that. What is that going to look like? To be revealed in glory in Christ, when you are like him. Because we know that when we see him, we will be like him. What is that going to look like? Got any ideas? I, I have no idea. What, what does a sinless human being look like? Maybe a little bit. No. <laughs> and that's just, just an aside. That's another reason it's, it's so foolish to think that you can earn your salvation and do anything worthy even after you've been born again. I mean, how, how, many, today, how many times today have you already sinned? Just a thought, right? Or a word or a deed. Have you ever done anything for God or for another person in the name of Christ that was done perfectly? Or was there always some sin mixed in with it? 
You're not going to raise your hand on that one? Nobody? I'm, I'm getting away because a uh, lightning bolt might hit. All right. I got to quit picking on Steve. <laughs> so we have this promise that we're, our lives are already hidden in Christ spiritually. And then that life that's hidden in Christ, when Christ comes back, is going to be revealed with him. That's a, that's a way to put that. So what we truly are will be revealed at that point, not what we are in this body. Because how many of you would want people to read your mind? <laughs> no? Okay. Because we know this is still, you know, pretty bad. All right. So then he goes on to say, another thing that we're to do, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Okay, now, I don't have the inspired version, the ESV, okay, but I did, I did prepare using the ESV. And if you, look in, if you don't have the ESV, uh, like the more saintly among us, uh, if you look in the margin you'll see a different translation. And this is what the ESV has or something like this. Instead of therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, it's literally put to death the members which are upon the earth. That's that mortification, okay? So working with the Holy Spirit and the power of God, we are to put to death the, the earthly members of our body. That is the, put to death the deeds of the flesh. So put to death immorality impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry, okay? So um, the, the word immorality is also fornication, okay? Uh, so because we have died with Christ, our old self has been killed, and we've been raised with Christ, then the proper thing to do is to consider that we're dead to that, and Fixing our minds on the things above, we are to put to death these things. Immorality, purity, passion, evil desire, etc. Um, so you can interpret that passage different ways, the way my NAS has it or the way the ESV has it. Uh, but there's another place in Scripture where Paul clearly says that we are to also consider the members of our bodies as dead to sin. So you don't have to turn there, but... In Romans 6, 11, Paul says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So part of putting our minds, fixing our minds on the things above, is to just do this. Consider that the members of your body are dead to sin. Okay? And you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what God has done for us. That's an, an, an indicative. Okay? So he's put to death the old man, and he's raised up the new man, even though we're still struggling in these bodies, and we're to consider that, right? And if you start considering that on a daily basis, maybe include that with your daily devotional time, think about how that's going to shift your thinking. You're going to say, wait a minute, I have rested in Christ. My salvation is dependent upon him, even though I'm still wicked and evil in so many ways, it's him and him alone, and what he's done. And at the same time, I consider that in Christ, since I've rested in him, God has put to death the old man in me and has raised me up to newness of life in Christ. So is it fitting for me then to have those evil thoughts? Is it fitting for me to be greedy? Is it fitting for me to engage in any kind of fornication or uh, other biblical words, porneia, or pornography, things like that. And what's the answer when you put it that way? No. <laughs> but it starts with that, that mindset. I think that's so remarkable that Paul in Romans says that. Consider yourselves. Something that we need to think about. That's considering something that God has done for us in Christ that is so wonderful. And then in verse 6... We get uh, a four here. Four, it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. 
and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So that's pre-salvation, pre-justification. You were doing those things. You were a son of disobedience, but now you're not. So it's not fitting for you to continue to do those things. But now you also put them all aside. And he goes on to give us another list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. And I just got struck to the core there because, and Pam can testify to this, I say things I shouldn't when I'm driving and people cut me off or not cussing at them, but just saying, you idiot, or, you know, Come on, Grandpa, move a little faster. And what, uh, do you say that too? You're laughing. I don't say those exact words. But, but something similar that. to that? But look at what we've just done. Uh, there's some anger in that. There's some wrath in that. Some malice. Slander. I don't know if that's a Grandpa. And I'm a Grandpa. <laughs> and I don't drive like one. <laughs> An abusive speech from your mouth. You know, that's, that's not good. And I've got to stop doing that. Okay? Um, I did get really angry, maybe justified so, when that guy cut us off on the right side because he about killed us. Um, but anyway. Uh, and then verse 9. Something else imperative because of what God has done for us. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed by a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Okay? So you're to... Lay aside the old self. That's, that's the idea, again, of, of laying aside the old self as a garment, or we could also say putting the old self to death, killing the deeds of the flesh. And have put on the new self, okay, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So we have this promise here. What else is God doing for us? Well, this new self is being renewed. Okay? So what does that refer to? That's the other meaning for the word sanctify or sanctification. So you have to keep in mind there are two meanings in the Bible for sanctification. Once you, the, the moment you rest in Christ and his finished work, you are justified. And Paul also tells us in Romans, you are sanctified. Okay? What does that word mean there when we use sanctified at the moment of salvation? It simply means that you've been set apart for God's work. It's for God's purposes. You've been set apart by God. You are now holy. Just like in the Old Testament, the, the priestly garments, while in themselves didn't have any intrinsic holiness, they were set apart. They were sanctified. They were considered holy because they were there for God's purposes. But on the other hand, the Bible uses the word sanctification in this way. It's that renewing, that over time, we become more and more like Christ more and more we put to death the deeds of the flesh, and more and more the new man is, is strengthened and shines through. Um, and I don't know if you notice this too, a lot of times it's through recognizing our sin that that process actually happens. Um, but that's the renewal. Now, notice the, the tense that Paul is using here, though. He's saying, and have put on the new self who is being renewed. Okay? Or if you look in the margin, I don't know, does it, ESV have renovated? Because in the margin I have renovated. No. Oh. So in my margin I have renovated. I, I kind of like that word better. We all know what renovation means, right? If you ever watch, any of you get into those home improvement shows, Chip and, Chip and uh, Joanna, home, you know, Fixer Upper and all that, they're always doing renovations. So that's a good word. We're being renovated, being remodeled, renewed to a true knowledge. Um, but I bring that up, notice that's ongoing, because there are different sects of Christianity that say through a, a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit or some mighty working of God, you can be sanctified holy, that is, made perfect. It's in the Wesleyan tradition that they do that. Uh, and so people go around saying that, I have been sanctified holy, I am perfect. I had an aunt that belonged to a, a church like that, and she would talk about being sanctified holy. And then my, my mom would question her about that and say, you don't sin anymore? Well, I make mistakes, but it's not sin. It's like, <laughs> uh, I'll give Wesley credit. I think he, he came up with that, and maybe not in the form that it is in today, but people ran with it. And I think he, he thought that he was talking about people being uh, uh, 
brought to a point where they had a, a, a pure love because of revival and awakening because he was around during the first great awakening. So I think that's where that came from. But it is not something that happens. We will not be made perfect until we see Christ face to face. Okay? Um, so we're going to still struggle with sin. And then... Um, and according to the image of the one who created him. So, so notice that God has created us, creatures, right? He created these physical bodies, but he's also created us in the sense that he's given us new birth. We've been recreated in that sense, and we're being made, formed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Okay, so what's that telling us? It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've come from. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, what race you're from. It doesn't matter whether you're slave or free. None of that matters. Why? Who's all in all? Christ. So it's all Christ. <laughs> we have nothing to do with our justification. It's all Christ. All right, so what do we do then? Verse 12, so as those who have been chosen of God, okay, holy and beloved, all right, and then there's the word holy. How many of you would go around saying, look at me, I am holy, in the sense that we normally use that? What does holy mean here? It's that first use of sanctification. It means you've been set apart for God's purposes. You've been chosen by him to be justified. It doesn't mean that you're perfectly holy, although in Christ you are. And beloved, okay? So as those who have been chosen of God, those are the indicatives. What's God done? He's chosen you. He has set you apart, made you holy. He loves you. You're beloved just as a son. Then here's the imperatives, the commands. What do we do? Put on a heart of compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Just a warning here, though, don't pray for patience, okay? Because when you pray for patience, what you're doing is saying, God, give me patience now. And God just kind of goes, all right, boom. And then it's like, why did I do that? And how many of you have prayed for patience I'm like that? And then God put you through a trial to teach you patience. It's like, I'll just, I'll be patient waiting to become patient. <laughs> I'm not going to demand it right now. But look at what we're to do. As those who have been chosen of God, so and are made holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Why should we have a heart of compassion? Well, did God show compassion towards us when he saved us? Absolutely. Kindness. Did God show kindness towards us? Absolutely. Humility. Did Jesus demonstrate humility when he left the glories of heaven to become a man? We just celebrated Christmas and to live in poverty, and to be rejected by his own people, and finally crucified between two thieves. Yes, he humbled himself, and he humbled himself to the point where he took the guilt of our sin upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, or in him might become the righteousness of God. So that was humility. Gentleness. Jesus also described himself as being gentle, and patience. And that patience there is patience with other people. So when Gramps gets, oh, sorry, when an old man gets in front of me and goes really slow, I need to be patient with him. And I often think about that. A lot of times it's on my way uh, past the hospital, and then they'll turn off and go to the hospital. I'm like, oh, I feel so bad right now. They're probably driving slow because they're distraught right now because one of their loved ones is in the hospital, and I feel terrible. So it's, and I'm reminded of this. I've got to show patience and humility and gentleness. So remember I, I, I mentioned that this, this renewal is happening in us individually. So there are things we do for our own personal renewal in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we're also involved in the renewal of those around us. So God's called us not to be individual Christians, but be to, to be a body of Christ. So, so notice what he go, goes on to say here. Bearing with one another. Yes, that means we have to put up with certain individuals. <laughs> and forgiving each other. Can you forgive me for picking on you? Whatever, whoever has a complaint against anyone. So, oh my goodness, even if you have a complaint against another one, forgive them just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Okay, there's another imperative with an indicative. Why should we forgive other people? Because God forgave you. 
Do you deserve to be forgiven? No. So when somebody does something really rotten and you're like, they don't deserve to be forgiven, you got to think, mm, neither did I. And so what are we supposed to do? Forgive. And that's not easy. That's what takes the power of the Holy Spirit. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So what's the perfect bond of unity? Love. That's what unites us. I think when you, when you look at the Trinity, you have a Godhead as, that is three persons but are so unified, God's one. And what's the glue that holds the Trinity together? It's, it's got to be love. And that's, that's what holds us together as well in our unity. And then verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Okay, here's that peace of Christ. Let it rule in your heart. That's not, I don't think, talking about inner tranquility. This is talking about that lack of war with God. So what are we to do amongst ourselves? Be at war with each other? No, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let it reign. Let it dictate what you do and how you treat one another. And this goes on, to which indeed you were called in one body, okay? And be thankful. So how many bodies were we called into? Well, we could have been called into the body called the Southern Baptists, or we could have been called into the body called the Presbyterians. Is that, how many bodies are there? One, okay? Unity, just one body in Christ, because we're all in Christ. Christ is all in all. Christ is not divided. I think Paul had to talk to somebody about that. Yeah, the Corinthians come to mind, because they were divided, because they were saying, I am of Paul, and others were saying, I am of Peter, and others, I am of Christ. Look at me, I'm really holy. I'm, right. So we're one body, we can't be divided. And, oh my goodness, be thankful and we've talked about this before. What's one of the things that God requires of us, demands of us, commands us to do as a result of what he's done for us? Simply be thankful. Right? In Hebrews, we, we covered that. That's the, the thankfulness coming from our lips is, the, is, or is one of the sacrifices that we offer to God as, as priests under the new covenant. Okay. Now, something else, verse 16 Another way that we do what we're supposed to do, put to death the deeds of the flesh, and also strengthen the new man in ourselves and in the body, is we've got to be in this. Paul says, let the word of Christ rich, richly dwell within you. Okay? So how do, we, how do we do that? How does it dwell in us? It's got to be... The, something that we're in all the time. It's got to be shaping the way that we think and the way that we act. And so let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And then we're to do that with all wisdom. So remember when we went through Ephesians, one of the things that Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers was that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of God. We've got to keep praying for that and asking God to, to do that in us. And so with all wisdom then, with the, the word of Christ richly dwelling in us, we are to teach and admonish one another. How do we do that? With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I probably should put a disclaimer on that. Okay? Most modern Christian music would not fall under any of those categories. <laughs> so just be careful. If you've listened to any of it recently, some of it's really bad. Now, there's some really good stuff out there, but doesn't you seem to get played in Spotify or, or Christian radio? There's just some really bad theology or no theology. It's just repeating churchy sounding words, right? You got to have water in it and, right? How many Christian songs had water in it? I'm sorry, there was, there used to be, I don't think they're still around, but there was like a, a social media in Christian group and they would, they would make fun of stuff like that. So they'd have like powwows with music executives and musicians saying, that song won't cut it, doesn't have water in it, or something like that. So. But notice psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So um, 
the Psalms, if you remember, you know, if you turn to the book of Psalms, those were songs that were sung. And in some churches today, they still sing the Psalms, especially in the Reformed traditions. Uh, hymns, those would be songs that are written after the truth of the Bible. Okay, so good sound theology and spiritual songs, same kind of thing. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So that, that music plays a big role in the church in teaching and admonishing one another. And I would imagine in the, in the early church, because they did not have individual copies of the scriptures, one of the ways that they would have remembered truths in the scriptures would be to sing the Psalms. And then also probably some of those, like the Christ hymn that, that uh, Chris put to music that we sing on communion Sundays, singing that is a way to remember that and to keep it in the forefront of your minds because what sticks in your mind better than anything else? Music. Okay. What was it? When we went to a Guitar Center. Uh, we were talking to, the, I, think, I think it's the owner, um, about Sam and his love for guitars and that, and, and the, the music that he liked. And um, We Will uh, Rock You was one of the songs that <laughs> he likes. And the guy said it's because of the rhythm. And then he made this comment. He said, music is a bookmark. He says, it always is a bookmark in your life. It, it, you, know, you, you can always think, I first heard that song when I was doing this or that. And so just think about the importance of really good, well-written spiritual songs, the Psalms and hymns, how, how those really stick in your mind. And that those are a great way to learn and keep in the forefront of your mind truths about God and what he has done for us. And that's I think, what, what Paul is saying there. And then Paul goes on to say, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So whatever you do in word or deed, if you do it, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I'm driving and somebody pulls me, cuts me off. If I'm thinking about doing what I'm going to do next in the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm not going to yell at him or call him bad names. <laughs> you know, a heart of compassion is going to come to mind. You know, maybe thinking about what, why they did that. Maybe there's a reason they're distracted and they did that. Maybe something really rotten is going on in their lives. I don't know. Um, so whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And, and I, I just, it, I love the, the, how practical the, the scriptures are, especially in the New Testament. I've given this a lot of thought recently. I've, I've often thought about as, as I'm growing and, and we've gone through a lot of things in our church and that, and then looking at the world around us, the church world around us, especially in the evangelical world and some of the, the compromises that are being made and the things that are going on, I think back and wonder how much of what I was taught to do in sermons or in Sunday school classes or just in the general um, life of, of a church, how much of it was actually what the scriptures say I'm supposed to do? Because I think back to the church I grew up in. I mean, and I, I, don't, I don't want to fault them. They, they put their money where the mouth was. They, they spread the gospel like crazy, okay? But I think part of the reason was the pastor at the time wanted to have the world's largest Sunday school. And so people were told, you know, you've got to be at every church service and every program and every time the doors open, you've got to be here. And people neglected their families, I think, to do those things. Or I don't, I'm, I'm torn on this one. You know, missionaries that are away from family and, and can't take care of family members, is that honoring your father and mother, is that right? I know sometimes you can't help it, and they're doing the Lord's work. They were called to that. So that's why I struggle with that one. But the practicality of, of how we live our lives, it's just how we live our daily lives. Um, if you have a job, no matter what it is, do you do it as unto the Lord? Do you see that as a sacred task that the Lord has given you? A vocation, a calling, just as important as a pastor's calling or a missionary's calling. So how do you conduct yourself in, in that job then? Do you do your very best as unto the Lord with thankfulness? Or do you grumble and complain? Um, if, if you're a caretaker, you know, do, you, do you take care of those around you in a proper way? Do you do it as unto the Lord with thankfulness? 
So it's just very practical how we, how we live our lives. And I've said this before in, you know, in Ephesians, when, when Paul starts to talk about all the, he goes on, the first three chapters, giving us all the indicatives, all the wonderful things God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And then he gives us the last three chapters of imperatives, the things that we are to do. And what do they revolve around? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Parents, don't exacerbate, exacerbate your children. Raise them up in the you know, discipline and instruction of the Lord. Children, obey your parents, for this is right. And he quotes the commandment in the Ten Commandments that... Um, tells children to obey their parents. And then slaves, masters, so work relationships. It's all very practical. And so whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So that means, hmm, you know, you go home and anybody going to uh, cook a meal? You ever think about cooking it as unto the Lord? Doing your best? That's some of the things I think we should be thinking about and doing. And that also means that when you eat the meal, especially if you put a lot of care and effort into it and it's really delicious, you can eat it as unto the Lord and enjoy it. Right? But do we think about that? No. I mean, we've made things so I don't know, churchy, can I put it that way, that you know, we've, we've kind of separated. We've, we've done the thing that, the, the, thing that um, the Roman church did for so long and it was... Uh, re, re, uh, um, recaptured in the Reformation. And that is um, looking at the tasks that we do, our jobs or vocations, as holy and as being um, sanctified and not seeing it as being separate from things that are more holy, like being a pastor or something like that. Everything we do should be sacred as if we do it as unto the Lord. And so that's something we have to think about. So in, in, in closing, then, just think about what you've been given. You, you rest in Christ if you're a believer. I don't have to work for my salvation. God has done all these wonderful things for me in and through Christ. And then what should I do in response? And Paul, wonderfully, because it's inspired, tells us that in Colossians. Also in Ephesians, they're very similar books. Um, and a lot of it is just very practical how you live your daily lives. And, and you can feel free to remind me of this when somebody pulls in front of me in traffic or you know, goes too slow. Uh, that, that one's going to take a work of the Holy Spirit. Really. So. Or traffic lights. <sighs> I just got to get that. The traffic, light, the traffic light on 70th and Holdridge, I've come to call that the bane of my existence because that light is always red. But I'm always backed up. But anyway. <laughs> You can all think of, of traffic lights like that. All right. Let's, so and so um, just, just for application, you know, just think about these things and, and really set our minds on the things above and not on the things of the earth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the practicality of it. And thank you that it is all through your work and your power that we are justified and that we are being renovated I pray that we would cooperate with you and seek that power as Paul prays that we would um, have our eyes open to understand the greatness of your power that works towards us who believe the power that you use, the same power that you use to raise Christ from the dead and to seat him at your right hand in the heavenly places. And it's also the same power you use to raise us from the dead and to seat us with him there. And that power still continues to work in us. So may we take advantage of that. I pray, Father, that uh, 2024 would be a year filled with um, minds filled with the things above and not the things below. And we ask that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.